It has truly been one of the greatest honors of my life to serve as vice president to our President Joe Biden. Kamala Harris's historic rise as the first woman of color on a major party's presidential ticket sparked excitement across the nation. But as the election cycle progressed, cracks began to form. Criticism over her readiness for the global stage and her policy positions grew louder, with some saying she was too radical for key swing states like Pennsylvania. Former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich believes Harris's campaign is starting to crumble under the pressure. But why does Gingrich think she's unraveling? To understand that, we need to know her background first. Early life. Kamala Harris was born on October 20th, 1964 in Oakland, California, a vibrant city in the heart of the Bay Area. Her mother, Shamala Gopalan, had come from India in 1958. Driven by a passion for science, she was a biologist who specialized in endocrinology and spent over 40 years researching breast cancer. Shamala's dedication and contributions to medical science were immense, and her work on the progesterone receptor gene played a significant role in advancing cancer research. Kamala's father, Donald J. Harris, had a different path. He arrived from Jamaica in 1961, enrolled at UC Berkeley, and specialized in development economics. Donald would later go on to become the first black scholar to achieve tenure at Stanford University's economics department, a groundbreaking achievement that cemented his legacy in academic circles. The two met in 1962 at Berkeley and were married by 1963. Kamala was born the next year into a household driven by intellect and cultural depth. The Harris family lived on Bancroft Way in Berkeley for the first two years of Kamala's life before relocating in 1966, when Kamala was barely old enough to remember. Her early childhood was spent bouncing between college towns across the Midwest. By the time Kamala's sister Maya was born, the family was already on the move living in Urbana, Illinois, Evanston, and later Madison, Wisconsin. These cities were temporary, however, and by the time Kamala was around seven, her parents' marriage had unraveled. In 1970, Shyamala packed up the girls and headed back to California. She settled in Berkeley, bringing Kamala and Maya with her while Donald stayed behind. The separation wasn't easy, but the girls spent weekends with their father in Palo Alto, education. Kamala's mother was more than just a parent to her. She was an intellectual giant who surrounded herself with African-American thinkers and activists in Berkeley and Oakland. Growing up in that environment, Kamala was exposed to discussions about race, activism, and justice from a young age, which would deeply influence her later in life. In 1976, another move came. Shamala took a research position at McGill University, relocating Kamala and Maya to Montreal. This shift was a big change for Kamala, pulling her from the U.S. to a new culture and language. However, she adapted quickly and graduated from Westmount High School in Montreal in 1981. Her academic path didn't stop there. After graduating high school, she enrolled at Venier College, also in Montreal. But soon, she set her sights on Howard University one of the most prestigious historically black universities in the U.S., located in Washington, D.C. It was a homecoming of sorts. Howard offered Kamala a chance to reconnect with African-American culture. At Howard, she became a proud member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority, a network of black women that had been established long before she arrived. Kamala thrived at Howard eventually graduating in 1986 with a degree in political science and economics. From there, her journey toward law began. Kamala attended the University of California, Hastings College of the Law in San Francisco, where she wasn't just a student. She took on leadership roles, becoming the president of the Black Law Students Association. Hastings laid the foundation for her legal career, and by 1989, she had her Juris Doctor degree in hand, early career. Her early career was a rapid ascent. In 1990, Kamala was hired as a deputy district attorney in Alameda County, right across the bay from her hometown. She wasn't just another face in the office, she stood out. 
People described her as an ambitious, able prosecutor, making her mark early on. Then, in 1994, Kamala's name started to buzz outside of the courtroom. She was dating Willie Brown, the powerful speaker of the California Assembly. Brown pulled some strings and appointed Kamala to the State Unemployment Insurance Appeals Board, followed by the California Medical Assistance Commission. But Kamala wasn't content with just appointed positions. In February 1998, San Francisco District Attorney Terrence Hallinan spotted her potential and recruited her to his office as an assistant district attorney. There, she led the Career Criminal Division, supervising a small team of attorneys who handled some of the toughest cases, like homicides, robberies, and burglaries. Political Prominence Kamala Harris's rise to political prominence was anything but subtle. In 2002, she launched a bold, no-nonsense campaign for District Attorney of San Francisco. She wasn't one to sit back and let the usual run its course. Running against her former boss, Terrence Hallinan, she was determined to differentiate herself. She openly criticized Hallinan's performance, especially his failure to resolve backlogged homicide cases. Her approach? Aggressive, forceful, and above all, calculated. The result? She won 56% of the vote, making history as the first person of color to hold the DA position in San Francisco. But that was just the beginning. The moment she took office, Harris made waves. Within her first six months, she cleared 27 out of 74 unsolved homicide cases, a problem Hallinan had been criticized for neglecting. Harris wasn't interested in playing politics. She wanted results, and fast. She also turned her attention to the city's gun crime issue. Her push for higher bail for defendants involved in gun-related crimes was her way of tightening up the justice system, shutting down the loopholes that criminals had exploited for far too long. One of Harris's biggest promises during her DA campaign was her stance on the death penalty. She vowed never to seek it, and she stood by her word, even in the face of intense pressure. When San Francisco Police Department officer Isaac Espinoza was shot and killed in 2004, the public, and even some police unions, called for the death penalty for the accused. Harris didn't flinch. She kept her promise, sparking backlash from law enforcement. But Kamala Harris was never about bending to pressure. She was firm in her beliefs, even if it meant going against the tide. Her commitment to reform extended far beyond gun violence. In 2004, she launched the San Francisco Reentry Division, a program designed to help nonviolent offenders transition back into society. Over six years, 200 participants graduated from the program, boasting a recidivism rate of less than 10%. Compare that to California's overall rate of 53% for drug offenders, and you start to see the kind of impact Harris was making. The message was clear. She was about giving people a second chance but only those willing to earn it. By 2011, Harris had set her sights higher, running for Attorney General of California. Her victory was no small feat, defeating Steve Cooley, the Republican candidate, in a race that went down to the wire. She became the first African American, the first South Asian American, and the first woman to serve as California's Attorney General. When she secured a $25 billion settlement for California homeowners from the nation's top mortgage lenders after the housing crisis. She didn't stop there. Her office introduced the California Homeowner Bill of Rights aimed at preventing unfair foreclosure practices, setting a new standard for protecting consumers. Harris was also known for her aggressive stance against corporate misconduct. In 2015, she took on Corinthian Colleges, a for-profit education company that had been exploiting vulnerable students with deceptive advertising. The result? A massive $1.2 billion judgment against the company for misleading students about job placement rates. Harris made it clear that taking advantage of low-income students would not go unchecked on her watch. But her tenure as Attorney General wasn't without controversy. Harris was criticized for her decision not to prosecute One West Bank, a financial institution owned by future Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, despite evidence suggesting foreclosure violations. Some saw her refusal as politically motivated, 
especially when Mnuchin later contributed to her Senate campaign. Harris dismissed the claims, stating that she simply didn't have enough evidence to move forward with a case. As Attorney General, she also tackled California's overcrowded prisons. The Supreme Court had declared the state's prison system in violation of the Eighth Amendment, labeling the conditions as cruel and unusual punishment. Harris, however, argued against the early release of inmates, citing concerns over losing labor that prisons depended on, such as inmate firefighting labor, a controversial stance that drew criticism. Despite this, she maintained a tough-on-crime approach while trying to implement reforms from within the system. After winning re-election in 2014, Harris began setting her sights on a national platform. By 2015, whispers of her running for the U.S. Senate grew louder when longtime California Senator Barbara Boxer announced her retirement. The race was on, and Kamala Harris was ready. She dominated from the start, gaining endorsements from President Barack Obama and Vice President Joe Biden along the way. In 2016, she cruised to victory, defeating fellow Democrat Loretta Sanchez, and became California's junior senator. Once in the Senate, Harris quickly gained national attention. Her sharp, no-nonsense style during committee hearings made headlines, particularly during the confirmation hearings of Jeff Sessions and Brett Kavanaugh. Harris was relentless in her questioning, especially of Sessions, who seemed visibly rattled by her pointed approach. Her prosecutorial background shone through, making her a formidable force in a chamber not known for such intensity. Harris's political stance leaned heavily on progressive ideals. She supported Medicare for all, fought for the legalization of cannabis at the federal level, and took a strong stance on gun control. Her voice on immigration also became louder as the Trump administration pushed harsh policies. She became a key figure in opposing family separation at the border, often confronting officials like Homeland Security Secretary Kirstjen Nielsen in Senate hearings. By 2019, it was clear Harris was setting the stage for something bigger. The buzz around her presidential aspirations was everywhere. And in January 2019, she officially announced her candidacy for the Democratic nomination. While her campaign initially gained traction, with memorable moments like her debate clash with Joe Biden over busing policies, it ultimately struggled to maintain momentum. By December, Harris ended her bid for the presidency, citing a lack of funds. But for Kamala, the journey wasn't over. It was only just beginning. Candidacy as president. Kamala Harris's 2020 presidential campaign kicked off with a bang. Announcing her candidacy in January 2019, she quickly emerged as a top contender for the Democratic nomination. The excitement was palpable. In the first 24 hours after her announcement, Harris raised a staggering amount of donations, setting a record previously tied by Bernie Sanders. Her launch event in Oakland was massive, drawing over 20,000 people. At that moment, it seemed like she was on track to become the Democratic frontrunner. Her big moment came during the first Democratic debate in June 2019. Harris didn't hold back. She confronted Joe Biden, calling out his past remarks about working with segregationist senators and his opposition to mandatory school busing. The moment was electrifying. The next day, her poll numbers shot up as voters saw her as someone unafraid to speak truth to power, even to someone like Biden. But this momentum didn't last long. In the second debate in August, things took a turn. Biden and Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard hit Harris hard, questioning her record as California's Attorney General. Gabbard specifically criticized her for blocking DNA testing for a death row inmate. These attacks landed, and Harris struggled to fend off the mounting criticism of her past decisions. Voters, particularly progressives, began to question her track record, especially her tough-on-crime stance. Her poll numbers took a hit, falling into the single digits. Despite a devoted online following known as the Hash Kive, which supported her through these tough times, Harris's campaign never fully recovered. By December 2019, the funding was drying up, and her candidacy was struggling to gain traction. She made the difficult decision to withdraw from the race, 
acknowledging that her campaign didn't have the financial backing to continue. It wasn't the outcome she had hoped for, but she wasn't out of the game just yet. After stepping out of the presidential race, Harris threw her support behind Joe Biden. She endorsed him in March 2020, showing a willingness to back her former rival. As Biden began to lock up primary wins, speculation grew about who he might choose as his running mate. Many members of the Congressional Black Caucus were pushing for Harris, and in May 2020, those calls grew louder. Biden had promised to select a woman as his vice president, and Harris's name was at the top of the list. By August, the speculation was over. Biden announced that Kamala Harris would be his running mate. It was a historic moment. Harris became the first African-American, first Indian-American, and only the third woman to be nominated for vice president by a major political party. Her law enforcement background, combined with her identity as a woman of color, brought a unique balance to Biden's campaign. The Biden-Harris ticket faced a chaotic election cycle, marked by the pandemic, economic struggles, and protests for racial justice. Harris stepped up in the vice presidential debate facing off against incumbent Mike Pence. She had several standout moments, but none more memorable than her now famous retort, I'm speaking. The phrase went viral, as many saw it as a powerful statement against being interrupted and silenced, especially for women of color. When the dust settled, the Biden-Harris ticket emerged victorious in November 2020. Harris made history once again as the first female, first black, and first South Asian vice president of the United States. The significance wasn't lost on anyone, and the video of her calling Biden after the win saying, We did it, Joe, became one of the most viral and iconic moments of the election. Harris had broken countless barriers, but her journey was just beginning. As vice president, Harris took on a pivotal role, especially with the Senate split 50-50. Her tie-breaking votes became crucial for pushing through the Biden administration's agenda. She cast her first tie-breaking vote in February 2021, helping to pass the American Rescue Plan, a critical COVID-19 relief bill. Throughout 2021 and 2022, she cast several more, setting a record for the most tie-breaking votes by a vice president in U.S. history. As 2024 approached, Questions arose about Biden's potential re-election bid. By mid-2024, Biden decided to step down, endorsing Harris as the Democratic nominee for president. It was another historic moment. Harris officially became the Democratic Party's candidate for the highest office in the land. Her campaign for the presidency in 2024 took off with energy. Within the first 24 hours of her candidacy, Harris raised $81 million in small-dollar donations, a record-breaking amount. By August, she had secured the Democratic nomination and, in a strategic move, chose Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz as her running mate. With a focus on climate action, voting rights, and national security, Harris positioned herself as a candidate ready to lead. The election cycle was intense, with Kamala Harris navigating a landscape filled with challenges. As the first woman of color on a major party's presidential ticket, every move she made was scrutinized. From her progressive stance on immigration to her ambitious economic plans, Harris balanced a wide range of issues. She was praised by some for her forward-thinking policies, while others criticized her for being too radical. Yet despite the heat of the campaign, she pushed forward making her case to the American people. But the pressure was mounting. With polls fluctuating and key battleground states in play, Harris's momentum started to wane. The stakes were high. She was not just running for office, she was fighting to break barriers. Yet the weight of her candidacy became heavier with each passing day. Voters in states like Pennsylvania and Minnesota began shifting their attention to the other side. As the narrative around Harris's policies and readiness for office began to change. And that's when voices like Newt Gingrich's came into play. The former Speaker of the House saw the campaign from a different angle. According to him, cracks were forming. He believed Harris's historic candidacy was starting to lose steam, hinting that she wasn't prepared for the global stage. 
Gingrich focused on her lack of experience when it came to international diplomacy, raising questions about her ability to handle world leaders like Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping. He framed her policies as too extreme for the average voter, especially in states with crucial industries like Pennsylvania, where energy and fracking were key to the local economy. For Gingrich, Harris's running mate Tim Waltz was also a problem. Waltz's background and campaign presence, in his view, did more harm than good. This, combined with the economic concerns many voters had, put Harris in a difficult position. Gingrich saw this as the beginning of the end for her campaign, convinced that the electorate was beginning to see through the shine of her historic bid. As the election neared, Gingrich's words echoed through the airwaves. For him, this race was about who could deliver real results, not just break barriers. And as more states looked like they could swing away from Harris, the question wasn't just whether she could win, but whether she was truly ready for the role she was fighting to achieve. If you found this video insightful, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any updates. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.